Welcome to EDD 939, Module 4. And uh, we're continuing to look at our elements of strategic leadership. And so this is Elements of Strategic Leadership, Part 3. It's Module 4, and uh, should you should be in Week 4 now of the course. Uh, so hopefully you're on track with that. Um, maybe you're a little bit ahead, um, but hopefully not, uh, not behind. And uh, you're continuing to work on the various assignments and reading responses and things like that. Uh, just a quick reminder, you can always reach out to me through the contact information that I provided in the syllabus, um, Canvas works as well, um, or also the, or I should say, and also the discussion section um, in the course if you have questions that you think might be of benefit to uh, everyone in the course, questions about an assignment or um, if there's technical difficulties or things like that. So um, just feel free to reach out and uh, stay in contact with me and, and let me know how things are going. So we are in, um, again, Module 4, Elements of Strategic Leadership, Part 3. Hopefully you've got uh, the PowerPoint slide deck in front of you there that you can be looking at and referencing as we go through this. And what we're going to look at in this module are the two, I guess, final elements, if you will, of strategic leadership, uh, at least the ones that I've identified, and those are strategy and leadership, which uh, hopefully makes sense considering it is called strategic leadership. Um, but we, we've talked about various aspects. We've talked about the mission and vision for your organization, the values that your organization has. Hopefully those are articulated. Uh, not just something that um, we, we just assume everyone agrees on. Uh, well, we have common values and we all agree on those. Uh, hopefully the, those have been written out and articulated and are there for people to see, to be able to look at and say, yes, I agree with those. Um, and then we talked about culture and climate as well. And so now we're going to talk about these two aspects, strategy and leadership. In this first lecture for Module 4, we'll be looking at strategy and then in the next one talking about leadership. I think um, it'll be the, the lectures for this module will be a little shorter than the last one. Um, hopefully that's okay with you. Um, I like to, you know, I don't mind having a week with maybe a few more lectures or a little bit longer lectures if I can balance those with weeks where maybe it's not quite so heavy just to make sure that you're able to do your work and stay on top of things like that. So let's dig into the content here. So, you know, I just ask the question, what is strategy? And hopefully you've given some thought to that. Um, again, if we were in class together, we, we would have a, a discussion about that. Of what is strategy? And I put there um, a picture of a chessboard just because I think most of us, and I, I said this in the beginning module um, when I was kind of doing an overall introduction, we talked a little bit about strategy and strategic thinking then, so some of this probably will be a little bit of a repeat, um, but repetition aids learning, right? Uh, but, but I think most of us, when we think of strategy, we think of something like chess or, or a game or uh, military strategy, things like that. And Probably, if I asked you to define strategy, some of you may say something in the general neighborhood of like a plan of attack or a plan to win. Uh, and, and I think those are okay aspects of strategy, but I think really there's more to it than that. And that's why I wanted to spend this particular lecture talking about strategy. So I gave you some definitions. One of those I gave you in the first module. It's from uh, MiriamWebster.com. Strategy is a careful plan or method, a clever stratagem, an adaptation or complex of adaptations as a behavior metabolism structure that serves or appears to serve an important function in achieving evolutionary success. Now, I think this definition is coming more from the uh, scientific, biological science area. That's what it feels like. 
but I actually think it's a great definition to think of strategy in terms of organizations and in terms of what we're going to be talking about uh, for the remainder of the semester. Uh, because especially when you get into those aspects of adaptation or complex of adaptations as of behavior or structure, um, that serves or appears to serve an important function in achieving evolutionary success. And at the very end of this course, we will talk about organizational change and, or, and strategic leadership. The, because I want, and, and I'm doing it because I want to spend some time very focused on change itself as, as kind of a, a special consideration. The danger in doing that is is leading you to believe there's this official thing called change, and sometimes there is. I mean, sometimes, um, an or and I'm getting ahead of myself, but an organization will go through an official change program, or or a lot of times now we call them transition programs because that sounds better than change, or we got tired of talking about change. But the reality is anytime you're engaging with strategic leadership and, and leadership as a whole, you're instigating some kind of change. Uh, in fact, uh, if you've been through uh, 932, uh, the leadership course for this program, I have you in that course read an article by John Cotter. And Cotter has written a lot about um change and a lot about leadership and he makes the argument because he compares leaders and managers if again if you've been through that course if you recall that article and his whole premise is leaders are engaging in change all the time that is the nature of of a leader i'm not going to agree with him a hundred percent but he's also kind of being a little hyperbolic in order to draw a distinction between leaders and managers or leadership and managerial skills. So all that to say, leadership is about change. So strategic leadership is about change. And so a strategy is it does serve an important function in achieving the evolutionary success, so to speak, within our organizations. As our organizations adapt and change, and, and modify themselves and, and um, adapt to the ongoing environment. Um, as I'm recording this, it's you know, May 5th, uh, 2020 here. And think of this last spring semester, speaking in higher ed terms, but this last spring, uh, late winter spring, the adaptations and changes that organizations had to go through. Um, and, and I mean, pretty much all organizations, not just um, educational, but well, now we've got to work from home. Well, now our students have to learn from home, but not just that. How have businesses had to adapt and change, hopefully in order to survive? Uh, some of them have not survived. Um, some, uh, I believe the jury is still out, but I'll give you an example. My wife and I were walking through our, our downtown the other day and you no, know, we weren't violating codes. Um, we here in Lincoln, were not under a strict stay in your house. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of walks and we were walking around downtown, which is pretty empty right now. Um, and there's a, a used bookstore that I've enjoyed frequenting over the years and uh, the lady that runs it they actually did an article about her in the paper I mean she's just independent um, small business owner and she's work doing her best in adapting to survive um, she's making home deliveries herself so you can buy books from her online and then she'll take them and or call it in and she'll find the book and bring it to you um, or you can pick up um, but she's also, I she had a sign in her window. She's doing, I think for several hours on Saturday afternoons, you call ahead and set up an appointment and she lets one person in the store at a time for an hour and you can shop. Um, so I, she's adapting, right? Hopefully she's going to survive. Um, you know, I like the used bookstores. Um, I like the independent small business owners. So I'm, I'm hoping she makes it. But that's just an example. And that's so all of that is part of strategy. Because again, I bring that home 
because we tend to think of strategy as um, the the big picture, long term. And so if we think of like a business strategy, we might not think of this lady who runs a, a small used bookstore in Lincoln, Nebraska. What we, but, but we might think about Barnes & Noble or Amazon or, or something, right? They, the big ones, they have strategy because they're looking at how do I um, open more um, stores and things like that. But it's about how we adapt. So then the next definition I give you there is business strategy. And I got this from Michael Watkins from a Harvard Business Review article. Um, Michael Watkins uh, has written a few books about leadership and strategy. He actually has a book I really enjoyed called The First 90 Days, talking about um, a leader when, more executive level, but when they move in, you know, his whole premise is President of the United States has 100 days. If you know, a new president comes into office, and then they always do a, a 100 day reflection. What have they done their first 100 days? Well, his argument is a, a business leader has 90 days. But anyway, um, but this article, he's talking about strategy and he says business strategy. And I realize we're not all businesses here, but I think we can apply this to, to organizations, whether it's a business per se or not. A business strategy is a set of guiding principles that when that when communicated and adopted in the organization generates a desired pattern of decision making to set of guiding principles that generates a desired pattern of decision making and i think that's a key definition and a key concept to remember and so if you look the definition that i kind of give there is the framework to enable and empower effective and appropriate decision making in your organization uh, or it, appropriate decision making to reach your goal obviously within your organization the framework to enable and empower effective and appropriate decision making to reach your goal and i just want to talk about these a little bit and that's the, the strategy should be those guiding principles. That's definitely part of that. But I like the part that Watkins added, and in this article he spends some time talking about this, and it, it, it results in or, or it helps you have a pattern of decision-making um, because that's really what it's all about. Um, I think arguably... One could say this, it, it, you know, you can argue with me about it. That's fine. I'm not, this isn't my, this is absolutely what it is. But I think one could argue that the primary activity, business, if you will, of any organization is making decisions. Um, you could probably say that about us as individuals, right? And the, the truth of the matter is you probably have some sort of, um, guiding principles that um, help you or generates a desired pattern of decision making. It's your framework that enables and empowers you to make effective and appropriate decisions to reach your goal. Uh, for instance, um, depending on you know how you were raised, uh, the value system you were in, if you're part of a faith community and, and principles and values there, all of those things are going to be a part of um, your decisions. Uh, for instance, if, if you highly value family and being close to family um, and a decision comes up regarding a job, that will guide your decision making to a certain extent. Should I take this job because it's going to require me to move, to uproot my immediate family? or move away from uh, parents and siblings, um, or um, it's going to, we don't have to move, but it's gonna take a lot more time away from my family, or it's gonna give me more time with my family, you know, to spin it to, to that side. So, all, right, I mean, hopefully that gives you the idea. We all do this, we, we have a framework, guiding principles within which we then make our decisions. Organizations, should not be, and, and they really aren't different than that. I think this is kind of like 
or this is why values are important, but also I think articulating your strategy, um, it, it, it really should be something that framework that enables and empowers should be articulated. We should know what that framework is. And, and part of that is going to be what we cover now as we move forward with the whole strategic leadership process, planning and things like that. The other part of this that I think is vitally important in my mind is that idea of empowerment. Um, we need to make sure that all of the various levels within the organization are empowered to make effective and appropriate decisions in order to reach the goal. So the question that naturally comes up is, first of all, do they know the framework? And, and I hate even saying it that way because I almost sound like I'm talking in some sci-fi, you know, we're all plugged in matrix kind of idea, you know, are you in the framework? That's not what I'm saying. But have we articulated the principles? So that might that's going to start with hopefully you're seeing the connection here this is start with mission vision values right have those things been articulated is when i've moved rooms on you but right here's is the mission statement on the wall so people can see that do do they know what the vision is where we're going do they have those values in front of them that they've looked at and they said yes i agree to this 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 is these aren't just the values of the organization but i'm on board with these values and then they see how those have all been put together to create this framework for effective and appropriate decision making. That's the first step in empowerment because how can I make an effective and appropriate decision if I don't know the framework with which to, to make it? I'll give you, hopefully this gives you a humorous example, um, but my oldest son, Justin, he's uh, 19 now, college freshman, um, Justin has always enjoyed um, eating, and, and I just, I don't mean that in a bad way, it's just he's been our kid. I mean, when he was a baby, we would feed him, and he just, mmm, mmm, the kids just always liked food. Um, and when we lived down in Greenville, uh, we have some, some friends down there, and um, this guy, Christopher, says him, he still jokes about it, um, but uh, he has a son who, who has special needs, and Justin really befriended him. And um, so they have a, a special friendship. And so for his son Carter's birthday, um, they wanted Justin to come over and go out to eat with him. And uh, Carter doesn't like big crowds, so he wanted Justin. So Justin was going out to eat with him, but they decided to ask Justin where he wanted to go eat. And <laughs> Christopher laughs, and Christopher loved it because he thought it was great, but he figured Justin would say Burger King or McDonald's. And, and Justin was like fifth grade at the time. So he gets in the car and they go, so Justin, we thought we'd let you pick. Where do you want to go eat? And he goes, um, Outback Steakhouse. So um, they truck off to Outback and they had a great time. And Christopher still laughs about it because here's this kind of, you know, pudgy little kid wanting to go to Outback when he figured it'd be fast food. Um, and now Justin, he said he looks back and he feels guilty about it because he's like, you know, I didn't know. I, you know they probably, it's too expensive and all this. Point being, he wasn't given a framework for decision making, right? There were no parameters given to him. An adult asked him, where do you want to go eat? And he knew he liked Outback, so hey, shoot the moon, right, for him. Um, and, and that's just an example. And, and too often what happens in our organizations, I've seen it happen, excuse me, is that we ask people to make decisions and then they make a decision and then we get upset with them or we punish them in some way because they didn't make the decision within the framework that we had, but we never told them what the framework was to begin with. So there... That, that first step in empowerment is, and, and enablement is they have to know what is the framework. So that should be articulated. That's why we went through talking about all those different aspects. But then the other part of empowerment is making sure that they truly are empowered to make the decisions. And, and empowerment is, first of all, do they have the resources that they need? 
um, to make the decision. So do they have the information? Do they know the framework? But do they also have the data and information that they should have um, to in order to um, make the right decision? Well, I shouldn't say right. Make an effective decision because sometimes there isn't a one right decision, right? Um, I just said right a lot. Uh, but do they have the information? Do they have the resources? And, and do they have the ability, if they are the person, to then implement the decision? And then also part of empowerment is making sure that they know they're safeguarded from reprisal. Um, that if they're the decision maker, one, that they and their team will be appropriately rewarded if it was a really great decision, right? I mean, if this is some kind of decision that is of great benefit to the organization, we need to be ready to reward them and not take that glory for ourselves if we're the superior. And I've seen that happen. Vice versa, we need part of empowerment is letting them experience the consequences. Now, I don't mean a punishment, you know, and because I've seen that happen too. You are empowered to make the decision. We're going to support you to make the decision. It doesn't turn out the best. And then all of a sudden it was those guys. It was their fault. They may, you know, I don't mean that. That's not empowerment. And you're going to very quickly, if you, if you take that approach pretty quickly, no one's going to want to make a decision. So if you're in an organization where no one wants to make a decision, no one wants to take that step forward, um, you might want to check the culture and climate to see if they if a culture and climate has been created where it's dangerous to make decisions because that's kind of a clue right there but but not that but i mean let them suffer the consequences from the standpoint of a lot of times leadership development falters because um, leaders aren't left in in positions long enough to see the results of their decisions and or they're shielded from those you know, as a parent, there are there are times I'm going to step in and help my kids, right? I'm not going to let them make such a def- devastating decision that that it could be harmful to them on, on a really grand scale. Then there's other times I'm going to let them totter out there and make a mistake. Let them, metaphorically, fall and skin up their knees. Why? Because that's how we learn. And so sometimes empowerment with decision making means letting people see the consequence. We may, again, this isn't going to be devastating to the organization. It's not going to cause a crash. It's not going to be devastating to their career. But I'm looking at going, "Mm, I don't know if that's the best decision, but we'll let it play out. And then it doesn't play out so well. Okay, what did we learn? Right, so all of that's part of, of tying into the strategy. And then I just, um, I, I gave you the Monopoly board there just because uh, to help you figure out, you know, it's your framework for effective and appropriate decision making. Um, and I think, and I'm actually going a little bit longer on this than I intended, so my apologies. Um, but, you know, when you have Monopoly, any board game, hopefully you have a strategy. Now, your goal is to win, right? Right. Your goal in Monopoly is to monopolize, hence the name. It's, it's to have the most money at the end of the game. It's to win. But then you have a strategy as to how you go about doing that. Um, and, um, you know, I think of when we would play Monopoly, and we like to play this game with my kids when they were younger. Now they're older, so they are developing strategies. Rats. Can't win as easily. But, you know, when they were a little kid, littler, Every time they landed on something, they're buying it, right? And pretty soon they're running out of money because they didn't have a strategy. Their strategy was just buy as many things as possible. And I guess technically that's a strategy. They didn't realize it was, but it wasn't very effective because pretty soon they ran out of money. So the games were a lot shorter. Now they have more developed strategies. They're thinking through what properties, if you know Monopoly, what properties do I want to buy? What's going to generate the most rent, but what's not so expensive? Where people land more often, right? I mean, doggone it, those kids are getting smart and they're developing good strategies. So I can't win as easily and the games last longer. That's what we're talking about. It's your framework for making decisions. So just some quick things about strategy that we need to remember. Strategy, even though it's in the name strategic leadership, is just one part 
of the overall strategic direction and strategic leadership of the organization. So let's not get so consumed with just strategy that we forget about the other parts, which we've already talked about some of those mission, vision, values, culture, climate, and we're going to be talking about leadership. And we're going to talk about strategic influence and things like that as we move forward. So strategy, even though it's part of the name, is just one part of many. Let's not forget that. And then the two final things here. Strategies can and should be adapted as appropriate. I mentioned this spring when I'm recording this with COVID-19. There was a lot of adapting of strategies and approaches, whether those are teaching strategies or business strategies, lots of adaptation. Strategies can and should be adapted. Um, where, where you can cause the ruin of your department, your program, your organization, is when you're dead focused, locked on, and saying, that's our strategy and I'm not deviating from it because things change. And so you've got to be able to adapt. Now, strategic direction... Not so much. And we'll be talking more about that as we move forward, not in this module, but in the future modules. I shouldn't be adapting my strategic direction because there's so much involved in that. Because overall, this is where we want to head. But my strategy on how to get there is what's going to be open to adaptation. So hopefully this has been helpful for you. Um, The next thing that I'm going to have you do, so lecture two, is watch another TED Talk. This one's rather brief. I think about 10 or 11 minutes, and it's a guy named Martin Reeves, and his his title is Your Strategy Needs a Strategy, and so he, I think, I, I appreciate what he says, he talks a little bit, he gets a little businessy, I'll warn you, but um, talks through um, the danger in only focusing on strategy and strategic planning and how there's some more angles we should be looking at. So I will see you back here for lecture three when we talk about leadership.